A wise man once said, the legal system can force open doors and sometimes even knock down walls, but it cannot build bridges. That job belongs to you and me. These provocative words brought me here today. They inspired me to step out of my day-to-day -day rhythm and share my story with you. So here it goes. I was a uh, pretty shy and timid kid growing up in Richmond, Virginia. In that sense, I was a lot like my parents, who are Muslim immigrants from Pakistan. My parents, like many first-generation Americans, were what I would call quiet integrators. They worked hard to earn a decent living. They focused on raising their family. They socialized with other families with, who had similar experiences as they did. And they made an effort to stay connected to their heritage and their traditions. It was their way of weaving into the fabric of our society. Some might say that they were a little insular. But I have observed that most of us can be quite insular. We tend to stay within our little bubble and then quietly integrate into those tight circles, often unmindful and even oblivious of those around us. For my parents, it was a way of adapting to a new and foreign culture. For me, it was a way of coping with my shyness. And for others, it's a safe and it's a comfortable way of being. In fact, it feels like a natural tendency to surround ourselves with familiarity. Nothing wrong with that, is there? Well, I learned the hard way that, yes, maybe there is. When injustice overpowers you, like it has for today's generation of Americans who are Muslim or perceived to be Muslim, prejudice, unfair stereotypes, sweeping generalizations, feeling alienated, misunderstood, and viewed with suspicion, most of us are trying really hard to make sense out of this social climate that seems to be singling out an entire faith community of over three million Americans. A community that's really been here all along, since the very beginning, yet for some reason has remained so unfamiliar. Several recent studies on American perceptions have found that Muslims are a highly disliked and distrusted community. And it seems like these feelings of dislike have manifested into acts of hate. Civil rights groups all over the country are reporting that hate crimes may be reaching their all-time high in the last couple of years against Muslims. The Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism reported 250 hate crimes targeting Muslims just in the year 2015. These include vandalism and arson at places of worship. They include execution-style shootings, beatings, and assault of shopkeepers and women wearing headscarves. In addition to these crimes, we're also seeing a growing trend of discrimination experienced by Muslims in their workplace, in communities, and in schools. Many of these experiences are injustices that the protections of our laws just cannot reach. For me, one of the most troubling trends has been a rise of bullying and hostility towards Muslim kids in schools, not only by their peers, but by adults in positions of authority. In a recent sociological study of Muslim high school students, uh, they found that ex perceptions of microaggression and experiences of discrimination have had damaging consequences on kids' educational outcomes, on their psychosocial health and well-being, and their sense of family and sense of nation and belonging. As a mother of four wonderful kids, ranging from elementary age to college age, it's something that I worry about every day. In fact, it's something every Muslim parent that I know worries about every day. When I was growing up in the 80s and the 90s, most of my friends didn't really even know where Pakistan was on a map. Uh, most of them didn't know that Pakistan is an Islamic country, or for that matter, what a Muslim even is. 
But now, of course, world politics has completely changed that. Before, my story was, was simpler and easier to share. There weren't as many preconceived notions to dispel. Folks were curious and eager to learn, and I was happy to explain. But now, there's fear and there's apprehension on both sides of the storytelling. But I'm still the same person. I haven't changed. But in a way, I have. On that day of 9-11, I was about four months pregnant with my third child. And like everyone else, I was devastated by the loss of human life. I was scared of the senseless violence in the name of extremist ideology. I felt helpless. As a mother, I was afraid for the future of my children, my unborn child, who would have to navigate this scary and violent world that we had become, a world that I never had to navigate. And at that time, I didn't realize that I would also become fearful for them just because of their Muslim identity. Since that day, it feels like the threads of the fabric are quickly unraveling and we're falling out. The threads of the fabric that bind us and cradle our community. But in the midst of the unraveling, I witnessed something else. I saw and I heard voices from Asian American communities recalling the Japanese internment camps, standing up for us. Voices from Jewish communities, very familiar with the horrors that, tr that were triggered by Jewish discrimination, standing up for us. Voices from African American and black communities who have endured a horrid history of slavery and Jim Crow and are still fighting for the value of black lives are standing up for us. Members of the LGBT community who face intolerant attitudes all around and hate crimes very similar to our community, they're standing in solidarity with us. Neighborhood Christian faith groups literally standing in front of our local Bon Air mosque, holding up signs of love and solidarity. And on a personal level, my, uh, my professors and my colleagues made sure that I know that they're there for me if I ever experience prejudice. Because of their voices, I don't feel quite so alone. These people, these day-to-day -day ordinary folks, standing up for me, standing with me, making an effort to build a bridge towards me and others like me. They didn't have to, but they did. To, for me, these bridge builders are our civil rights leaders of today. Where their effort is not on changing the laws, but changing a culture of reticence, a culture of insularity. They taught me that there are those who are trying really hard to weave us back together. They taught me that I am connected to them, that our fates are bound together, and that injustice towards one is injustice towards all of us. But most of all, they inspired me to action. I now know that I can no longer exist in my comfortable bubble and allow others to challenge injustices, fight the wrongs for me while I reap the benefits. I can't just remain neutral or stand on the sidelines when I see injustices happening to other people in other communities. Because if I do, my silence, my reluctance, will allow the voices of injustices to grow louder. So whether they know it or not, these people in my day-to-day -day lives have given me the courage to break out of my reluctance, the courage to share a piece of my story with you, to build a bridge towards you, so that we can continue the work of building bridges between communities. So how do we do this? How do you build a bridge from quiet integration to what I would like to call active integration? Well, one thing I know is that I don't need to change who I am. I don't need to transform into a forceful extrovert or run for political office to bring attention to injustice. 
but I do need to be willing to step out of my comfort zone, my insularity, and allow myself to be vulnerable to the new and the unfamiliar. For me, that has meant learning how to be a vocal advocate for the Richmond Muslim community, for, for my community of uncles and aunties, very much like the Khizr and Ghazala Khan, families that have nurtured me since I was a child. For some of us, it means attending a vigil to support the LGBT community after the Orlando shooting to mourn the loss of precious human life. For a local Pakistani physicians group I know, it means volunteering at local healthcare clinics like the Daily Planet, or raising money for victims of disaster. For some of my Muslim girlfriends, it means learning how to become a foster parent, or a child in need of assistance volunteer, or to build a network of support for new refugees resettling in Richmond. For the um, members of our mosque, it may mean engaging in interfaith partnerships, organizing food drives, blood drives, even a Muslim day at the General Assembly. You may have other ideas, but however we choose to build our bridge, the reward of weaving ourselves with people and communities who we may not be used to connecting with really helps to tame our fears and prejudices that are looming inside all of us. Fears and prejudice that may even be the source of our insularity. So the wise man whose provocative words inspired me are none other than Justice Thurgood Marshall, a civil rights lawyer and the first African American justice of the Supreme Court. Not all of us can become a justice marshal, but most of us, in our own individual ways, can stand to do a better job of building bridges within our spheres of influence, which are the key to weaving us back together, the key to actually constructing a system that, that collectively challenges the day-to-day -day injustices that sometimes the protections of our laws cannot reach. So when I leave here today, I'll jump back into my day-to-day -day rhythm, but I'll continue to do what I must. What will you do when you go back to your day-to-day -day rhythm? Will you quietly integrate back into your circle of familiarity? Or do you care enough to expose yourself to the unfamiliar and activate justice in simple ways? It's about time that we all become part of the civil rights movement. Thank you.